and you're watching In Conversation With, I'm Leonie. Out of the 66 books in the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes is one that we will look into in more detail in this episode. And we will seek answers to questions like, who is the author of the book? And why does the book seem so negative towards life? Let's look into these questions and more together with Professor Dr. Craig Bartholomew. Professor Craig is the director of Kirby Lang Institute for Christian Ethics and Senior Research Fellow at Tyndale House, Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Professor Craig is the author of many books, including The Drama of Scripture, Finding Our Place in the Biblical Story, and Ecclesiastes Baker Commentary on the Old Testament, Wisdom and Psalms. An Old Testament scholar, he grew up in South Africa and recently he is Professor of Philosophy at Redeemer University College. Let's have a talk with him. Thank you, Professor, for sharing with us and spending some time. It's a pleasure. Yeah, good to be with you. Can I ask you the first question? Yes, of course. We learn that the book of Ecclesiastes is considered as you know, the wisdom of literature. Mm. Can you first explain to us what do you mean by wisdom literature? Yeah, so in the Old Testament, there's four books that are called wisdom literature. And a wisdom literature really is literature that is trying to answer the question, how do I navigate the challenges, the problems, the sufferings, the joys of life uh, successfully? So, so if you think of the book of Job, for example, Job is asking the question, how do I live suffering? Okay, Proverbs is a book that has all sorts of practical things. How do you deal with wealth? How do you speak properly? Uh, if you encounter a fool, that's one thing uh, uh, Proverbs has a lot to do. How do you speak to a fool? When do you not speak to a fool? So that's wisdom. It's very practical, and it's asking, how do I live each day so that I navigate all the challenges of life successfully? Can you share with us, so what are the books that fall into this category? Okay, so there is some discussion about that, but it's definitely... Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, and then many people would say Song of Songs or Song of Solomon is also in there. And then uh, people think that there's parts of uh, uh, other books of the Bible that are also wisdom literature. Now, compared to the other books that fall into this category, mm -hmm. what do you feel or what do you think as the uniqueness of the book of Ecclesiastes? Oh, okay. Well, it's, uh, I've done so much work on Ecclesiastes. You know, my doctorate was on Ecclesiastes. But I think Ecclesiastes is so important and it resonates so much with us today because the author uh, or the main character in Ecclesiastes generally translated as the preacher. He, now, we don't know why, but he finds himself that his life has reached a point where no matter what area of life he looks at, he comes to the conclusion, uh, in Hebrew, it is Hevel Hevelim, Hakol Hevel. And our translations translated in all sorts of different ways. So the most common English translation is vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. The Good News Bible, useless, useless, everything is useless. Uh, the New International Version, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. So now, and you know, if we weren't so familiar with it, we would really be surprised. Here is a wisdom book of the Bible, and the main theme that occurs again and again is meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. So, and that's what the book is struggling with. And I think in the world in which we live today, especially the West where I come from, many, many people are struggling with the issue of what is life about. And, and they, they're finding in their experience that it seems so meaningless. And so it amazes me that God has given us a book which embodies exactly that struggle. 
I just think of in the context of the East, they find meaning in religions. Yes. Well, and, and so I think that's one big difference between the East and Southeast Asia where we are now and the West. Because in the West, to a large extent, we have lost religion. And so that has produced a vacuum of meaninglessness. You know, so many people in the West, their struggle is exactly the struggle we find in Ecclesiastes. Some people say that even in the East, even when they routinely worship or they have a religion, mm. they just do it as a routine. So in a way, maybe they're still yeah. seeking the meaning of life, even though they go and worship and have a religion or a mm. belief. Mm. I, I think so. You know, so I think part of being human, part of the way God has made us, is that we need to know, you know, why? Why am I living? What is my life for? Where do I derive meaning from? And so this is a perennial human pursuit. But it is incredible to me that God's Word addresses this so powerfully in the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to go and ask you more on that. But sure. Yeah. You mentioned the preacher or the author. Yeah, yeah, Can you yeah. share with us, so who is this preacher? <laughs> okay. So, you know, scholars disagree, okay? The, if you read Ecclesiastes, the author, the, 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 the person who edited the book describes the preacher as though he was Solomon. Now, some people think, uh, this is Solomon writing. Uh, I am with the majority of scholars who think we are meant to imagine the preacher as Solomon. But I don't think either way it matters too much. But the point is this. What we know about Solomon from other parts of the Bible is that he was gifted uh, uh, from God with tremendous wisdom. So you have to defamiliarize yourself with Ecclesiastes. So you sit down, you have to imagine you're encountering this book for the first time, and it's a bit like you're presenting and you say, today we are delighted to welcome the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon. And then you can imagine your audience think, oh my goodness, what is Solomon going to tell us today? And then you get the biggest shock of your life. Because Solomon opens his mouth and he says, Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. So the authorship is tremendously important for getting us to imagine the power of this book. That someone who was so gifted with wisdom, how could they possibly come to this conclusion? Which is my next question. <laughs> because how could somebody yeah. like Solomon be so negative, which is what a mm. lot of people feel. They feel like this book is as if at odds with mm. the rest of the books because it's so negative and the feeling of hopelessness. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so exactly. So, and I think that's what the book is about. So as I said earlier, the main character of this book called The Preacher, now we don't know how, but he has found himself in an existential crisis of meaninglessness. No matter what area of life he looks at, whether it's architecture, singing, dancing, he goes to the law courts, wherever he looks, he comes to the conclusion, everything is meaningless. So that is the question that Ecclesiastes is struggling with. How does a person get themselves into such a position? And I would have to explain this in a lot of detail, which you won't want me to do now. But I think what, what we see as, as the preacher journeys, what becomes apparent is that in trying to answer this question, he is relying on his own observations, his own reason, and his own experience alone. Okay? And uh, a big word for this which uh, we may want to unpack a bit. In other words, he's trying to resolve this question based on his own resources on human autonomy. 
And the, the thing, he, he, he thinks he's being very wise. So he's like a professor or a great academic. But what, as the journey develops, he starts to see, I think I'm so wise, but I'm actually conducting this investigation foolishly. And so uh, by the end of the book, the, the, there's a little a proverb that indicates something has changed. Uh, that it's beautiful to see the light of the day, whereas all the rest of the book, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark. And then you get the exhortation, remember your creator before all the bad stuff happens. So I think uh, the reason that the book is so dark is he, he's experiencing these terrible things, but he's trying to solve them based on his own reason his own experience alone. So this is not the wisdom of Proverbs. Proverbs says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. This is actually the opposite. So does that make sense? Yes. Uh, you know, it's complex. But I think, uh, so this is why Ecclesiastes is so incredible. He has someone, like so many of us in the West today, who feels caught in the middle of meaninglessness. So he, he decides to make an investigation to try and find his way out. Whichever way he goes, he runs up against meaninglessness until eventually he realizes the way I'm doing this investigation is wrong. I actually need to get back to starting with remembering my creator. Which yeah. I guess is something that we all can relate Whenever we want to find meaning in life, but mm. depending on our own intelligence and our own sources outside of God, yeah. it's not possible. I think, so. I think that's the point. And so that's why this is such an amazing book, because in the West where I come from, everyone is trying to find their way apart from God, just about. And Ecclesiastes tells us, if you do that, you will keep running into meaninglessness, despair, hopelessness. But if you can find your way back to starting by realizing you are not God. So remember that God is the creator, you're a creature. Then you can find your way to hope amidst all the struggles. Now the thing is, as Christians, we are usually familiar with some parts of the book only. Or maybe even mm -hmm. some of the common verses in Ecclesiastes mm -hmm. 3. For example, yes, and they keep quoting. There is a time, yeah, yeah. And they only know that part of the mm, book. Mm. They don't really read from the beginning until the end. Mm. So, what do you think about that? Because do you mm. feel that Christians, you must read it? And if they should, mm. with what kind of mindset should they see this book amidst the other books in the scripture? Yeah, yeah. So, they absolutely must read the whole book, <laughs> okay? Because you know, what you will find in Job and in, in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes throughout the Bible, you will, if you just take one verse, it can say the most terrible things. So just think of Ecclesiastes, everything is meaningless. And imagine if you're having a bad day and you just read that verse. Well, that's not what God is saying. So you've got to read, each verse must be read in the context of the whole book and then the whole Bible. You know, so Ecclesiastes uh, is a hard book to read as a whole. And uh, let me try and explain this as clearly as I can. So what Ecclesiastes, I think, would say to us, life is difficult, life is complex. Now, what Ecclesiastes then does, it performs that message in the type of book it is. So scholars, when they read Ecclesiastes, they really struggle. Is this book positive? Is this book negative? How does this thing fit together? And I think the reason for that is that that's what life is like. So Ecclesiastes, you have to struggle with it. I, uh, I don't know if this is a good illustration, but when I was doing all my work on Ecclesiastes, it often felt like trying to hold down all the tentacles of an octopus. And you would just think you had them all down, and then there's one waving to you over here. 
But that's because that's what life is like. So these books, uh, Job is another example. Now, uh, I, I would imagine not many of us read the whole of Job because it's so long. And you think, why is this book about suffering so long? And the reason is, that's what suffering is like. It feels like it just goes on and on and on. And you, you read the book of Job and it repeats itself and repeats itself. Why? Because that's what suffering is like. So these are actually very powerful books. But we definitely, and I think not just, you know, that you and I should be reading them, but we need our preachers to help us. So I, I think, for example, I've taught Ecclesiastes in one hour. I've taught it in three hours. So, but you, we need to help people to know how Ecclesiastes fits together as a whole. That would be a huge service. Why do you think some people have the opinion that you should not or you should avoid preaching on this book alone? Mm, mm. Because you came across such an opinion mm, before. Mm. Well, some people think Ecclesiastes is just negative. But I think that's wrong. One thing to realize when you read Ecclesiastes, this is painful stuff. You know, Job's pain is physical pain. He's got boils all over his body. Ecclesiastes, the pain is mental pain. This is the terrible struggle. I cannot find meaning in life. I'm very powerful. I'm very wealthy. No matter where I go, all I find is meaningless. That is excruciating. It's like a most profound depression. Okay, so what I love about that, here the Bible connects with things that we experience, but it doesn't leave us there. Ecclesiastes shows us how to come out of that to a place of hope, still with the struggles, but through remembering our Creator. So I think this is a book we have to preach. It's in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. yeah some people prefer to preach the easier books, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and this is a hard book. This yes. is a hard book. So, but I think, uh, you know, we are in it, uh, certainly in the West, you know, I, I'm not as familiar with Indonesia or Southeast Asia, but uh, it's a strange thing, the world we live in, in the West, people will pay enormous money to avoid suffering. So, and we've eradicated a lot of disease, but then we have brought our own uh, struggles. So in, in Britain, where I live now, for example, amongst young people, struggles with mental health have reached proportions we've never seen before. Why do you think is that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think a whole lot of reasons. Social media, uh, the loss of religion and the culture. I'm going to stop you for a while. Why do you think social media yeah. actually contributes to this mental depression? Because I'm sure wherever we are, <laughs> so is we media. are in yeah, social yeah, media. Absolutely. Well, you know, it was only when I was an adult that computers arrived. So I grew up without social media, without computers. The danger, I mean, social media is a good thing. We can connect with each other all around the world. But the danger is that young people have access to material that they should not have access to. So if they are feeling depressed or something, they can go on to Instagram or whatever, and they can find uh, stories of suicides and other things, and then they end up doing this themselves. So I, I think we have... Uh, unleashed forces in our society that were not there before and uh, it's very damaging you know so this is what in the west i think especially if i may say so this has always struck me in america that if we can do something if we can like with technology we should do it and then if we have to we pick up the pieces later Whereas what I think we have to do now with all the technological changes, we have to ask, what are the implications of this? You know, and so our children, I mean, many of them are on texting all the time on Instagram, Facebook, etc. Full exposure to the Internet and they're being exposed to stuff that is they should not be exposed to. 
So I think that's just one, one of the reasons. Yeah. I guess one of the things that we can clarify is that we are not saying that we should live without social media. No, no, no. That's no, right. No, no. But we have to be aware no. of the potential danger of what social media can impact all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. So a friend of mine in Canada wrote four books on technology. And I was speaking to him one day and he said to me, Craig, you must make sure that technology is your servant, not your master. You know, but see, with, with, with sinners, broken people, it easily becomes a master. Then constantly, you know, we, we can't not have our phone all the time. We can't not be texting. We're checking for email all the time. So a good servant, but a bad master, I think. <laughs> so coming back to this book. Yeah, yeah. Because we see the relationship between, or the relevance of this book to our lives, actually. Mm. So, coming to the end of our conversation, mm. for viewers who are now thinking, yes, okay, I will start reading this book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, please do. The viewers should please read it. <laughs> yeah. So, why do you think they must read it? Mm, mm. Well, uh, because I think we're in a world now uh, we're, we're increasingly in a global world. So this is what we call globalization, where these things are being felt all over the place. So social media, you know, it's not confined to America or Britain, it's, it's everywhere. So I think these problems of uh, having a meaningful life, they are particularly felt in the West, but I think people will be experiencing them in Indonesia, Asia, uh, so Korea, for example, I went to Korea a few years ago, absolutely loved it. But amongst the young people, it has a very, very high suicide rate, which is very worrying. So that means there's a lot of young people who are finding life meaningless. This is a book that can help. So I think whether you're struggling with meaning yourself or you want to help someone who is struggling with it, this is a profound book about how to live out of that struggle back towards hope, you know? So I, I think it's a very important book for our time. And one last question for me would be, when we read this book, mm. any practical tips or particular mindset that we must always keep whenever we read it? Mm. Because you say that this is a difficult book. Yeah, very so difficult, we want to yeah. encourage the viewers mm. when they come and open the pages of the Bible and when mm. they start reading, mm. any kinds of mindset that they have to always keep as they read? A few things. The one is this is God's Word. Now, God has given us such an interesting Word. You know, so sometimes when we think this is God's Word, we expect uh, you know, the Westminster Catechism or something, whereas this is... This is the God has given us such a rich word. So one should always come prayerfully, saying, Lord, uh, here am I, your servant, speak to me. But then you've got to, uh, one thing with Ecclesiastes, read it against the background of Proverbs. So Proverbs is the foundational wisdom book in the Old Testament. So it sets out the basic principles of wisdom. So it's very good to know those before you read Ecclesiastes. And then I think, read it trying to follow the journey of the preacher. And if you get stuck, speak to your, your pastor and find a good commentary. And there are good commentaries there that can help you with the book. But the, so it's not easy because life is not easy, but it's worth the struggle because life is worth the struggle. Yeah. So, any final words from you with regards to what we have discussed? You can speak directly to the viewers. Well, just that I think uh, the world desperately needs wise people today. So, it's been absolutely wonderful for me this last week to visit Indonesia for the first time. And I'm encouraged uh, with all that is going on here. But I'm aware that as in the country I come from, Britain, we face many problems. Here in Southeast Asia, you have problems that you face. What we need to face those problems is wisdom. And this is what God offers us 
especially in these Old Testament wisdom books. So my prayer for uh, the church in Indonesia and Southeast Asia is that you might become wise. Thank you, Professor. That's a pleasure. Yeah. And thank you too, wherever you are. We hope and pray that always our programs at Reform 21 can be a blessing to you. I'm Leonie. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.